Okay, thank you everybody for tuning in and for joining. Tonight, we are continuing our shiur on the history and on the development and the text of the Amidah, the Shemona Esrei. And tonight, I apologize for my allergies, um, we will be discussing what it means to interpret the Amidah. And uh, just to begin, this shiur is the Lumi Shmat, um, Yehuda Arya Leib ben uh, Rachel ben Saraleah, and also the Lumi Shmat, Miriam Bat Bracha. Okay, so to review, I'm just going to let Avner in. Okay, so to review, Last time when we discussed and we were talking about the Amidah, we spoke about the historical study of the Amidah. And I want to quickly recap um, where where we left off with, because we we, we began with the historia, the historio, yeah, historiography. We began with the study of the study about how the the investigation into the history of the Amidah went. And we began with the Gemara and the history of the Gemara last time, how the Gemara tells us that the Shmon Esrei was canonized or composited in Yavne by Shimon Apokoli in front of Rabbi Gamliel. And if, give me one second to, to clarify uh, one of these slides here. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so to recap, the, I'm just going to go further in the slides. To recap, Rabbi Gamliel by Yavne took over the academy or took over the rabbinate, the ruling position of the of the Jewish people after the Hurban Habayas in the year 70, after the destruction of the temple. And we're going to move through this part a little bit more quickly because it's, it's very much a, a, a recap. You see, Rabbi Gamliel um, went to Vespasian and he asked for, uh, sorry, Rabbi Yechonon went to Vespasian. He asked for, for Rabbi Gamliel, for the Shushilta, the dynasty of Rabbi Gamliel and the Chachamim and Yavne. They went ahead and took over the reins of of leading Klai Yisrael after the destruction. Now, one of the projects that Rabbi Gamliel thought was very important was to unify the service, to make a nationalized service that wasn't revolved around Karbanas, that wasn't, um, what's it called, a, a cultic worship, rather a service of the heart and Avodah Shabalev and Avodah, which did not require the Beit HaMikdash. And this was a revolution to have a prayer that was simply a verbal communication and meditation with Hashem. Now, we discussed a lot of the prehistory last week as well, because everybody agrees that the Amidah is a composite prayer. It is made up of 18 different blessings, and many of those blessings precede the, the generation of Rabbi Gamliel. And therefore, we, were, we discussed the history before and the history during the era of Rabbi Gamliel. And many of the earliest uh, so-called detectives, the historians who study this and the scholars who study this, came to various, very different conclusions based on their own methods. For example, uh, Rabbi Yom Tev Zunz and Ismar Elbogen, these, these uh, scholars assessed the Amidah with the tools of philologists. They assumed that there was an Ur text, an original text, and Rabbi Gamliel composed an original text in Yavne, and that original text ha uh, could be peeled back if you just reverse engineer all of the layers of the... Shmon Esrei, piece by piece. Furthermore, because they're philologists, they usually see the history as progressing, meaning that they're going to see a what's called a diachronic history, where piece by piece, um, different parts of the of the prayer get added, different parts of of the the literature, the 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 object in question gets um, gets added parts to it over and over, and and different parts of it get changed. So they studied it as a composite prayer where um, they studied it as a composite prayer where the Amidah had various brachot, which were invented in various generations. Let's say, for example, Reina Ve'anyenu would have been for a specific era of persecution. And over and Rabbi Gamliel and Yavna set, up, set down, let's say, these 18 brachas in this order. But not that, that he invented these brachas, rather he composited them. And they believed that there was a set at the time in Yavna, there was a set um, Nusach, which was uh, put down, and it was based on a, a much uh, a, a much more complex prehistory. Next, we moved on 
to scholars like Rebasev Heinemann and, and Ezra Fleischer. Rebasev Heinemann, of course, rejects the philological school. He says that we cannot look for an or text. We cannot look for an original text because many of these blessings existed and were composed among a groups, among different groups of social circles in Eretz Yisrael. There were different sects of Judaism. There were different um, groups of people, both who were rabbinates, who were not people who were not uh, among their abanim. There were different social groups of people who prayed in Eretz Yisrael. We know that for a fact. And many of those brachos were developed in different groups under different social contexts. So you can't look for an original text. There was never an original text of the Amidah. The Amidah was the, um, or basically Heinemann held that the Amidah was the uh, result of many of the brachos coming together in the time of Rabbi Gamaliel and Yavne. Not that Rabbi Gamaliel Yavne even himself made an or text. That he himself never redacted an original text. And finally, we saw uh, that Ezra Fleischer tried to uh, to push back with the traditional view. He pushed against Yosef Heinemann. He said, no, you're wrong. Because if you think about it, Misvara, how could Rabbi Gamliel go ahead and make a takana, an institution for the entire Kala Yisrael, and say everybody has to be reading these 18 brachas, and yet not provide them with a text? You can't say that he, he, he told people, okay, say 18 brachas, and he didn't provide them with a nusach. You can't make such an elaborate takana. Therefore, Ezra Fleischer believes that it's imperative to say that there was an or text, there was an original text, and it's only the Yerida Sadaira, it's only the degeneration of, 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 the, of the various times and epochs that brought us to the situation where we have now, where there's multiple variations, like the, the Eretz Yisrael nusach and the, and the Babli nusach, and he believes actually the Babli nusach is probably closer to the original. Finally, we saw there was a pushback from other scholars who saw that there are flaws in Ezra Fleischer's methodology, especially because in the Tanoic era, in the time of the Tanoim, we simply don't see uh, any evidence that there was a fixed text. It looks like it was much more fluid in the time of the Tanoim. It looks like people had much more arbitrary, um, uh, what's it called, freedom to write or, or to recite the Shemayin Esra however they wanted to, even, to, even combining brachas sometimes. So, therefore, they argue that his methodology is flawed for different reasons, and also that that in the time of the Tanaim there was no fixed text. Maybe in the time of the Maraim there was there was a a a more of a uh, a there was growing a Nusa Hakeva of Shmeinesrei. Lastly, there's a middle ground. When we get past all this controversy, was there an original text? Wasn't there original? Uh, was was there not an original text? We have scholars like Rub David Henschke and Ruben uh, Kimmelman. Both of them are Orthodox rabbis. Um, Ruben Kimmelman has a Sephardic shul in Boston. Uh, both of these are scholars, um, David Henschke in Bar-Ilan and Ruben Kimmelman in, in Brandeis. So their their expertise leads them, at least the, as some of the most some of the more modern research on this topic. They they believe that perhaps the image is a little bit more complicated. You see, the issue with with Fleischer is that Fleischer believes that that Rabbi Gamliel had full authority over the entire Klai Yisrael. That's a very facile, if not naive, thing to really uh, to really assert, to say that Rabbi Gamliel, he was going to say something and everybody was going to immediately, uh, what's it called, listen? That, that's not a rabbinic reality in the time of the Tanoim, especially in the time right after the Beis HaMikdash. So they believe that perhaps Rabbi Gamliel, um, uh, what do you call it, gave a Nusach HaKeva, or he gave something similar to a Nusach HaKeva, but he delivered it to the academy. For example, it might be that Rabbi Gamliel only had a authority over the academy, and he didn't even know or expect the synagogue to take on this practice, or um, he expected the elite who were able to study and pray in the academies and the synagogues to be able to recite his prayer, but not the masses, not the people. We know Rabbi Gamliel didn't, was, was a fairly classist person. Um, so we just don't know. It could be that he said, okay, here's an order of 18 brachas, and if you're elite, you should know how to say Ishmael Nasre because you're, you know, you're a Tamachacham, and everybody else he didn't really care about, or um, there could be some mixture of realities here. So we can't know the exact history. The prehistory is a mystery, and the history of Rabbi era is also a mystery. But if we're going to interpret, if we're going to interpret the Shemayin Esrei, and we want to come, you and me, and we want to learn Shemayin Esrei, interpreting presupposes that you have meaning. If you're going to interpret a text, then your assumption is that there is a deeper meaning in the text. And 
how what kind of meaning you're going to find in the text depends on your orientation. How are you studying the text? That's going to deeply affect how you uh, your conclusions for how you interpret the, the text. So now before we start going through all 18 brachas, we have to prepare ourselves for the different methods that we're going to uh, be using. I should also mention that up until now, we're discussing really the what happened. Now we're going to discuss the why, the motivation. Just like by every prayer, we're looking for, um, we're, by every prayer we study, we look we look at what were the motivations be behind writing this prayer. The same is true with Shemayin Esrei. Just like any other prayer, we have to look at the text and say, why did someone write this tefillah? Why are these 18 brachas chosen? Is there a message in all of them? Is there a message that, is there no message whatsoever? Is there a structure to it? Is there some scheme to it? Is there, like, what is the deeper meaning of it? We're looking for the motives. We're looking for the motivation for somebody to compose a text like this as the core petitionary prayer or as the core prayer for Klai Yisrael. What is the, what is the motivation? General, general prayer, I understand the motivation for. Okay, we need a nationalizing service. We need uh, to restore the avoid of, of the base of Mikdash. But why this specific prayer, what are the motivations behind this prayer? Okay, so let's discuss orientations, and we're going to do this a little bit, tiny bit academically, but we're not going to get, we're not going to make this too complicated, I promise. Let's divide this, as Ruben Kimmelman does, into two general orientations. The first orientation that you could take when you study this is the historical. If you study the Shemayin Esrei as a historical text, you're not studying it as a finished product. You're studying it as a composite prayer, which grew over time. Therefore, most of your results, most of your study is going to revolve the diachronic history. How uh, piece by piece, layer by layer, the and change by change, the Shemayin Esrei uh, evolved into what it finally became. And that usually involves fields like philology, right? Very common to do that with classical texts. A semantics, which looks for the, the, the meaning behind the text, and exegesis, which is essentially the study of wisdom literature and, and which is very, very popular in rabbinics. If you take that orientation, those are going to be the um, those are going to be the solutions and the conclusions you're going to get to. So if you think about that, if you study it strictly as a historical document, right? If you study the Shemayin Esrei strictly as a historical document, which has a diachronic history, then strictly, you don't have to say that there is a motivation to its creation. You don't have to say that within the text itself, you're going to find a deeper meaning. All you need is coherency. The sole purpose of the text was external to the text. We needed a nationalizing service. We needed petitions for people to say every day. The whole meaning of the prayer is very external to it. The whole purpose and the motivation for creating the prayer would have been external. And therefore, anything that they brought into it would have just been, okay, we need, we need a prayer of petitions. Let's, let's use these 18. So all you need is a coherent flow. And you don't really need a deeper meaning. Sometimes, besides finding a coherent flow, you could go a little bit further and say, well, we could still use exegesis because perhaps there is an anchor in this flow. It's not just coherent. Perhaps the flow itself also comes from, uh, there's a source. Perhaps we do these 18 brachas because they are modeled after a similar set. So in other words, even if you study this historically, and you say we're going to study it as a, uh, not as a finished product. Eventually, your Begum Liel set down 18, right? So if he set down 18, why did he choose this order and how did he make it coherent? That is something you could study even if you are in the school of studying it historically. Okay, and just as an example, um, look at the Gemara Brachas. That's called me. Why do we say these 18? We have three uh, models. One model is, well, there's 18 Hashems in Havu B'la Hashem B'nei Kalim. Rabbi Yosef says, well, there's 18 Hashem, Hashem Hashems in Kriya Shema. And Rabbi Shubham Levi says, well, there's 18 vertebrae in the spine, which is probably a, a, a mystical concept. Further, you have the Gemara Megillah Daf Yudzayin Mabez. Menai Chem Avis, how do we know that we say the first bracha? Shenem or Havu L'a Hashem B'nei Elim. Right, the sons of Elim. How do we say Gavur Hashem? Right, praise Hashem with uh, glory and might. 
ומנהית שאומרים קדושות שנאמר אבו להשם כבוד שמו שתחוו להשם בהדרת קודש. So as you see, it's modeling the Shemon Esri after these three. The problem is that that gets a little bit clunky, because as it says, the next part of the Gemara is Umar Olam or Bina Achar Kedusha, and then, it, and then it breaks off from that, from that parak of Tehillim, right? Previously, we were using Chavtes uh, and Tehillim, but now it's like, well, the next Hashems in, in Mizmar Ladavid, Havul Hashem Ben Elim, don't have anything to do with it. So in order to maintain consistency and to give us ourselves an idea of the flow, we have to resort to using a logical connection rather than using simply a scriptural uh, connection. So what's happening here is essentially the Gemara is treating the Shemayin Esrei just like a piece of Mishnah. It's, a, it's just like the Mishnah. Every, every single part needs to have a source in the Taira, and we'll break it down one by one and why piece by piece this was put here and that was put there. And most of the anchors are external. Most of the anchors come from a model, which is Tehillim or, or, um, or logic or, or what have you. The problem with this uh, approach is that it doesn't lead you to really an internal coherency. We have no idea why Salah Lanu and, and Hashivenu are different brachas. Why can't I put Tzlich and Shuvah on the same? What is Re'ina Vanyenu? Why, why do I need Gula here when I'm about to speak about a bunch of Gulas? What is Shema Kaleinu? What, why, what, why do I need a bracha like Shema Kaleinu over there? Um, who are the Geri HaTzedek? There's, there's, it's, it's very jarring how you go from one bracha to the, to the next bracha when we don't really have an internal coherency. So it doesn't lend very well to give you a smooth flow when you take an approach, an exegetical approach, uh, such as the one of the Gemara. It just doesn't really give you a deeper meaning in the text. It just gives you a coherency. And so that's really indicative of somebody who's studying it as a historical document. Now, the Rishonim, some of the Rishonim, Rishonim study the, the Shemayin Esrei and they try to get it to, to get to a deeper place. Instead of just looking at the, uh, what's it called? The flow of the brachas. The Rishayim want to look at it as having a tripartite structure. It has a three-part structure, to say that more simply. And they believe that if you look at the structure, you could, look, you could find more meaning in it. And they divide it as follows. There's the first three brachas, the 12 intermediate brachas. I know there's really 13, but, you know, you could count it as 12 if you don't take maminim or if you combine a semach and shulayim. First, in other words, first three, introduction, 12 intermediate, and then the final three brachas. Why do they do this? Well, because you have Amr Vihuda, we have a we have Gemara brach, it's a very famous uh, uh, Gemara, the, in the Flam Dal, it says, right? Don't ask for petitions in the first three or the last three brachas. Only in the middle, because the, the middle three are meant for petition. Demar Bechanina, Rishayinah is doim elevet shemesadr sheva chafanei rabbi. Rabbi Hanina says here, and this is similar to, I think, Rabbi Shubha Levi in the Yerushalmi, he says that the first three is like, it's, he gives a mashal of an Eved coming to ask something, a servant coming to ask something from his master. First, he begins with praising his master. Then he asks him for what he need, needs, and then he says words of parting, of leaving. The, the, the tour has a girsa here, Shemeshavachai Bahalech. That he praises him and then he leaves. So the Rishayim, such as the Rambam or Sadi Gain and others, they see this tripartite structure as being the first three brachas, praise. The middle brachas, petition. The last three brachas, thanksgiving. And that gives you a framework for how the Rabbanim understood the proper way to pray. For example, we know if Simlai says that you have to say praise before you begin petition. So the Rambam saw this and he looked at the Shemayin Esrei and he said, you know what? Rabbi Gamliel was trying to design a tefillah according to the way Tarish Valpes says you have to design a tefillah to Hashem. And because Rabbi Gamliel wanted to do this, he created a, a quintessential tefillah where it begins with praise, the middle is petition, and it ends with thanksgiving. The issue with this is that, honestly, we don't have that kind of uh, exactitude when you actually look at the brachas themselves. The first three brachas uh, they're not just praise. They also have petition, right? Meir et al. Um, the last three brachas are not just Thanksgiving. Ritzay, Ritzay is not a Thanksgiving bracha. Uh, Sim Shalom is not a Thanksgiving bracha. So some of the Rishayim, like the Torah says, well, the last three are also praise. And honestly, the, 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 there is a difficulty which, which is struggled with. If you look at the Manig, for example, or I should say not the Manig, uh, Rabinu Tam and the Ri and others, they say, well, 
you know, if it's the since the first three and the last three brachas are really collective, there these are really brachas which are, uh, which it would have which have petitions for all of Kla Yisrael. Therefore, it's the same thing as praise because it's like praising Hashem. Everybody needs God's rachamim. Therefore, showing God that you depend on Him as a collective is in a, in and of itself praise. You see, they're really trying apologetically to revert and to come back to this structure because to them the structure is what gives it meaning. The whole meaning of the prayer, the, the deeper meaning of the prayer, is that this is the quintessential way to pray. When we want to approach God for petitions, this is the quintessential way to pray. And the Ramam doesn't even see deeper meaning in the middle brachas. The Ramam says, well, these are the archetypes. right? These are like the, you know, the, the, main, uh, the main 12 types of needs that humanity might need, whether they're personal, whether they're collective. Um, other Rishayinim say, well, the number of 18 is very magical, and therefore, you know, you have to anchor... Uh, well, each bracha has its own magical connection for, for 18 brachas. There's the spheras, there's this, there's this and that. But besides this tripartite structure, the, this influenced later even more breakdowns. And I wish I could make charts of this, but some of, some people broke it down that, well, the first six of, of the petitions are, are personal. The second six are collective, right? We're going to see this as we study bracha by bracha. Problematic, of course, is Bracha 7 because nobody could agree on Reina Vanenu, whether it's personal, whether it's collective. Some say the first uh, the first six you have, you could also divide those into three. The first three are for, for uh, spiritual uh, redemption. The second three are for, for physical needs. Very interesting ways of breaking down Shemad Esrei into a symmetry because they believe that very much there, there's no, um, what's it called, internal meaning or message of the Shemad Esrei. The Shemayin Esrei is a quintessential tefillah. It's a petitionary prayer created by Rabbi Gamaliel B'Yavna, and therefore the structure is the most, most meaningful part, and the coherency and the flow is, is, what do you call it, and the logical connections are the way to study Shemayin Esrei. Now, there's another way, of course, of studying the Shemayin Esrei, and that is studying it as a finished product. If you take the orientation the literary orientation of studying Shemayin Esrei, then you assume it's a finished product. And you say, okay, somebody wrote this. Someone sat down, let's say Shimon Apicoli wrote this down, and he did it deliberately, and he had in mind what he was doing. I agree it's a composite prayer, but somebody sat down and wrote this. Somebody compiled into a composite these prayers and decided on another song. If that's true, then you need a synthetic meaning. You need what 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 uh, uh, literary critics would call a, a total or a synthetic meaning, meaning that there is some sort of overarching message or overarching communication that's happening in this piece of literature. You have to find such a a meaning, and to do that, you could use one of two tools. Either you could use exegesis. Um, I think I'm saying that right. It could be exegesis, but I think it's exegesis. Um, and. <laughs> Secondly, you could use literary criticism. So exegesis would be the more the hermeneutics, the more classical way of studying Shemayin Esrei, which is using uh, the tools that we use to study wisdom literature, as the like the Torah, and we'll use all the tools that are very typical of the hermeneutics of Pirush. Or you could use literary criticism, which is much more analytical. So the the pioneer of of looking at Shemayin Esrei as a, a, not just Shemayin Esrei but Tefillah as literature is the Rekeah. The, the Rekeach, or the Lazar Rekeach, wrote an entire sefer called Pirish Hatzfila. Uh, Pirish, uh, Hatzfila. I forgot what he exactly called it. But he wrote an entire Pirish on the Siddur because he assumed that the Shemayin Esrei, the Amida, and all the Tefilais were finished products written with intent. And therefore, he looked for the meanings, the hidden meanings, and the, and, and the uh, explicit, both the implicit, explicit, and hidden meanings of the Shemayin Esrei. That was the Rekeach's, uh, he was one of the first Rishayim to do this. Abu Durham also follows in his, in his footsteps in some ways, but in my opinion, Abu Durham actually focuses in many ways more on halakha than he does on, 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 on the, the literary, on the exegesis. The second way you could study this <clears throat> is, oh, and I should mention, <clears throat> usually the framework is, uh, is external. If, if you do believe that the liter that uh, what do you call it? This literature that this is a literature, and it's just a let's say you say it's a simple list of petitions. Still, you do need a conceptual framework. So, if you're going to say 
that let, let's say you're like the Rakeach and you're going to say, well, this is, this is a, there is an internal message, but the internal message is petitionary. You still need a conceptual framework, which ties the entire Shemay together. And usually such a framework is external, but you could also somehow argue that there's some internal message, that there's something that the author is trying to tell you. Sometimes you could say that, but again, this wasn't done in their time of the Rishayim because they simply didn't think about it that deeply. They thought about it in much more of an exegetical sense than they did uh, as, as, a, as a piece of literature. Now, if you decide to take the literary critic criticism work uh, approach, I'm sorry, then three tools are the most important for us. And in literary criticism, there's many, many tools to study text. Well, let's just take three of them. And I'm going to use these examples because um, I'm basing much of this year tonight on Kimmelman's work. But um, these are three that he enumerates that are really important. First of all, recontextualization. Recontextualization is usually concerned with the difference in meaning of uh, the original context versus the present context. So you could have a text or a prayer which originally was used for X, and now it's being used for B, for, for, for Z. Uh, you could have uh, a reign of Anyenu, which is based on a Pusik. Originally, the Pusik meant A. Now, here in this tefillah, it means B. Studying the context of what it means to the worshipers, what it means to people writing it, and what it means to the people who hear it is an important part of uh, the criticism of understanding, of critically studying, uh, studying the text. Next is the concatenation. Concatenation simply means we're studying the sequence. Why does this bracha come first and the next bracha come second and the next bracha come third? Why after this bracha do you have the fourth bracha? Sequence is incredibly important when it comes to studying a piece of literature. Why, does, why is this first, this second? Why do you put this plot line before that? The concatenation and the sequencing of uh, your argument in, 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 uh, in a composition is incredibly important. And lastly, intertext. Intertext is very easy to explain. That's all the text that's implicit. For example, for Bechiram began my Nasrei with Hashem Sefasei Tiftach Ufiyagin Tila Secha. Let's say Rabbi Yechanan had that minute, right? And we follow his minute today. There is an implicit text there. Because if you are not biblically tone deaf, you know that that comes from Tehillim. And that's Nun Aleph in Tehillim. And what are the next Pesukim in Tehillim? Hashem Sefasei Tiftach Ufiyagin Tila Secha Ki loitach peit zevach ve'atena oila loitertze Because Hashem does not want me to bring sacrifices. And he does not desire burnt offerings. True sacrifice to Hashem is a contrite spirit, and Hashem will not despise a contrite and crushed heart. This is a beautiful message, which would be coming from people who experienced the Chorban. They're saying that Hashem, they're beginning the, the Shemayin Asri with, with words of asking Hashem to open their mouth, but implicit in that is saying we can't bring their Karbanas, nor do we believe Hashem might want our Karbanas anymore. Rather, Hashem wants our honesty, Hashem wants our hearts, and Hashem wants us to approach us approach him with an avoidance of belief. That's the intertext, when you have implicit text, which is not necessarily um, explicit in the Shemayin Asrei. So now, when it comes to the study of Shemayin Asrei as, 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 as literature, the, the first, I say the first, one of the more, the first serious attempts might have been Liebreich, but let me first give you what Ezra Fleischer did and his, his appraisal of it. Uh, give me just one second. Right. Ezra Fleischer believes that the tefillah, and I should go back here one, one uh, I should just, you know, I'll end the share, for, the share for a second. Ezra Fleischer believes that the tefillah itself is a prayer with an organized plan. There's a logical sequence where, and he's studying, again, only, uh, I, should, I should point out, he's studying the middle 12 intermediate blessings. He believes that we look at these 12 petitions, there's an organized chronological plan. First, we pray to Hashem to grant us knowledge, right? With knowledge, we people as a as a collective, not just as individuals, will know why our world fell apart. We will know why the temple was destroyed and why the, our independence was taken from us. In other words, he sees this as he takes the historical critical approach. He sees this as being written by a writer who's trying to explain to people and trying to... Um, yeah, not to, to to explain to people why there was a destruction and how we should think about the destruction. He sees this as as a prayer that's speaking primarily about the destruction and is saying, Hashem should give us das to understand why what happened happened to us. With that das, we would realize that it happened because our, of our sins, right? We have salach lanu. And if we realize it was because of our sins, 
then we will do tshuva. And if we will do tshuva, Hashem will give us geula. And if we will do geula, then then we will bring the geula, which will bring us healing. And it will bring us the next bracha, which is uh, sustenance. And it will bring us uh, the, the uh, what do you call it, collective freedom. And he goes through all the brachas showing how there is an internal message here. And he believes that the internal message is um, a perspective on the Chorban. And if Rabbi Gamliel B'Yamna was writing Shemayna Esrei, or Rabbi Shimon Apokoli was writing it in the generation that experienced the Chorban, this text, this, this text is a tefila that explains and guides people's thought through how they should think about the destruction. What caused it and how could we fix it? So it's a petition primarily for redemption, but it makes the it makes its case essentially that we have to pray step by step in order to redeem ourselves or step by step to get out of this destruction. And there's there's an organized chronological plan for how we're going to get out of this gullus. But it's very much destruction based. Now the problem with this is, is that it's really the historical the critical historical approach where you're anchoring it on history. And that's very difficult to do uh, from from a methodological perspective. It's very difficult to anchor um, a text, especially if it's a composite text, on saying it specifically happened because it happened in this era, and this bracha happened in that era, and this and this this section reflects that era. This this section reflects another era. It's kind of difficult to do that uh, from a methodological perspective. Also, uh, Fleischer's method here grounds itself very much in the chatimot. Because he only uses the Khatima, Baruch Hashem Khanina Dat, Baruch Hashem um Khanun Rabelislah. Why why does he only use that? Because Fleischer is smart. He knows that that's the most stable part of the blessing. If you're going to study this academically, he knows that the content of the blessing doesn't matter as much because the content changed over generations. The or text, the original text was lost. But the most stable part of the blessing, that was the last, that was the eulogy, that's the peroration, the uh the the Khatima. The of the bracha, that was the most stable part. So we know the topic of the bracha, and we know they're stable both in the Bavli version and, 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 and the Eretz Yisrael version. Therefore, we could use those as our as our guide. Again, those are two flaws in how Fleischer understands um, understands the Shreinas, right? So comes along Ruben Kimmelman in the 90s, and he decides that we could do this another way. He says, what if we argue that this is not just regular pers- uh, literature, this is persuasive literature? What if the Shemayin Esrei is trying to make a case? Is trying to make an argument? If that's really the case, then this is rhetorical criticism. We have to study this with the tools of rhetorical criticism. We have to find out what is the, the Shemayin Esrei trying to persuade us? What is, it, what is it trying to persuade the crowd that is going to read it? And his assumption is as follows. His assumption is that post the Khorban, or even, sorry, during the, the generation of the Khorban, there were many, many, many different sects in Eretz Yisrael with all of their different views about how Kla Yisrael was supposed to repair the damage done after the first Korban and repair the national unity or the national identity in wake of the Roman Empire controlling Eretz Yisrael. There was a huge mess. The politics are too much to get into right now. The infighting is too much to get into right now. But the shrillest voices, the voices who were the most annoying, and the people who were the most dangerous were the people who were apocalyptic. The people in Eretz Yisrael who believed in a mighty apocalyptic war that's going to bring the Mashiach to be to, to redeem us, those were the most dangerous people. Whether they were Christians, whether they were Bar Kokhba people, anybody who believed in an apocalyptic eschatology, that they believed that the end of days was near and we have to bring it apart down, we have to use a mighty war to restore God's kingdom, those people were really dangerous. And the Rabbanim distanced themselves from them, as Rav Yechanan did. And by distancing themselves from them and going directly to the Romans and suing for peace, Rabbi Yechanan went ahead and was able to establish the Rabbanim as the most successful sect in Eretz Yisrael. And after the Churban, the Romans, the Romans gave the Rabbanim the authority of Eretz Yisrael, not the Christians, not uh, any of the other sects in Eretz Yisrael. The Chachamim themselves wanted to distance Yiddishkeit from an apocalyptic view of the Geula. They didn't want people to think that the Geula needed to have a mighty, bloody war, which was going to kill everybody. So the message of the Chachamim here in Shemayin Esrei is that the Geula is going to be done by God alone. Hashem himself is your Goyal. And the, the 
Mashiach himself, it doesn't matter who he is, it doesn't matter what family he is, it doesn't matter what he's going to do, it doesn't matter what kind of war he's going to take, it doesn't matter how the battle is going to, if there's going to be battle or not, and what dynasty he comes from and what his identity is, none of that matters. The Mashiach is an afterthought. The Geula is extremely important, but Hashem is the one who promised us the Geula, and he is going to redeem it to us without violence necessary. And that's how Ruben Kimmelman sees the, the argument of Shmei Nasri. It begins with pro- showing that Hashem is the Redeemer. Hashem is the one who, uh, Hashem is the one who promised to our Avais that he would give us a Geula. And Hashem is, next you have the Bracha about Tchias Amesim. He promised us that he would give us the uh, Tchias Amesim. And then Atta Kadesh tells you that Hashem promised us that he is going to remain our king over, uh, uh, he's going to remain in our our king, our sovereign, forever. And then the Shemayin Esrei persuades you. It says, well, think about it. You could start with a personal redemption. Everybody could do slicha. Everyone can do tshuva. Everyone can receive a personal geula. Everybody can be redeemed on a personal level. And if that's true, then you could, and a personal level, which is spiritual. And that's pers- and, and if that's true, you could also have a, a, a personal redemption, which is material. You could have uh, what's called Rafua and Bracha, and because we know this is true, because we know that we could appeal to Hashem for redemption in our personal lives, so too can we do that collectively. And step by step, we could bring the Cheiros, we could restore the judges to Yisrael, we could restore uh, the 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 Shaiftim, and we could destroy all the 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 bothersome sex, and we could rebuild <coughs> Yerushalayim. And uh, etc. So he sees this as a total persuasive message, and the Shmaynesri ends by telling you uh, with a with a um, a hope for universal redemption that Hashem is going to recognize all of humanity, especially in Maidim, all of humanity as worshiping Hashem in the future in peace. So that's essentially Kimmelman's uh, argument that that the Shmaynesri has a persuasive lean to it, and that is trying to make an argument for a Geula which is uh, feasible and applicable and possible. Uh, a geula, which is personal and, and attainable, really, that's the word I'm looking for, is attainable for all of Klai Yisrael, both on a personal level and on a collective uh, level. So he agrees, again, with Heinemann that sequence is very important. When you look at the ar- the order, one after the other, of what bracha uh, comes after which, the sequence uh, is incredibly important for the, uh, what's it called? The concatenation is really important to lead into the persuasive argument. Also, again, his his study is very uh, detailed, and sophisticated. He has a lot of other rayas from from the intertext and from and from uh, many different ways of arguing his point. Again, it's it's long. It's for specialists. I wouldn't recommend everybody read it, but um, it is a, a very interesting argument, and that's essentially where the study of of Shmaynesri leaves as we have it today. So as we go further. Um, in our study, Shemayin Esrei, when we study the first brachas, we study the following brachas. We have to keep these terms in mind, that there's historical ways of studying the Shemayin Esrei, and there's literary ways of studying the, the Shemayin Esrei. We could look at it as a historical document, and we could look at it as a work of literature. We could sometimes see it as having an internal message. We could sometimes see it as having a message or causes that are completely external. And it really depends on how you view the Shemayin Esrei and how, what your opinion is of its history, and that's going to lead you into understanding the Shemayin Esrei and the results, um, and it's going to lead you to your conclusions in how you understand the Shemayin Esrei. Most importantly, of course, everybody knows that the most successful rituals are those that have symbolic elasticity, those where the symbols inside the ritual can are elastic. Over time, one symbol can mean something else in every other generation. And this recontextualization that we do generation after generation has made the Shemayin Esrei an extremely su- successful prayer because it's so it's so um, fluid, it's so elastic that generation after generation, it never lost its pertinence. And this is some a theme that we're going to see in the Shemayin Esrei of how a universal and pertinent the Shemayin Esrei strives to be. So thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. Again, this year is Le'iluni Shemat Yudari Leib. Ben Saralea, I'm sorry, uh, Saralea. We she's a big supporter of the Shear, and we I only heard about uh, her son passing away very recently. It's a very tragic um, situation. Also, today is my sister's yard site, Miriam Basbracha. Um, I hope we should learn Leila Nishmasa. And if anybody has any questions, I will take them uh, now.